Okay, welcome. All right. Can okay. I just mention something about Please go the, ahead. about the diarrhea thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, I the reason I didn't talk about it because I was going to mention things they don't have in the movies about space exploration, like when people have attacks of diarrhea. But the reason I dropped it was because that was Frank Borman on Apollo 8, and it felt in very bad taste. But now that I've brought it up, I've nevertheless still made it as bad. <laughs> <laughs> you should have mentioned that, by the way, during your talk, we were uh, sort of sitting on the edge of our seats because uh, most of the things, well, at least at, at some point during the lecture, were not the things that we actually talked about you're going to talk about. So but yeah. it's, uh, is, is that the usual way you actually yeah. go about things? Okay. I, I, I was doing a Douglas Adams event in, uh, uh, there's a book that's recently come out of all kind of just Douglas Adams sketches that he left behind, stuff that he did very early on. And the woman who was doing the captioning for the event said, can I see your speech? And I went, I'm really sorry, I don't really do a speech thing. She said, what are you going to talk about? I said, I think at this moment I'm going to talk about this, but it may well not be. And then the guy before me was John Lloyd, who actually produced The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and he met, mentioned Niels Bohr. So that was the end of that. So I did 15 minutes on Niels Bohr instead, because it's like I, my brain will just... It's the great story of Niels Bohr. I'm sure you know this. You know, Niels Bohr was at Wolfgang Pauli when he went to watch a lecture by him. And uh, he went up to him afterwards. He went, just so you know, we all think your idea is crazy. But is it crazy enough? Which I think is a great look at kind of... And the other one is when he, his lucky horseshoe. Niels Bohr had a lucky horseshoe, and, and someone went in one day and said, Niels, you're a scientist. You can't believe in lucky horseshoes. He said, I don't, but apparently it works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, um, let's start with, uh, uh, with the usual question that we actually ask our, our guests uh, at the beginning. You've been in Bulgaria for, what, like 24 hours now, like close to 48. Uh, any first impressions that you want to share? And please be kind, or don't. Amazing place, fantastic place, great people, and uh, wonderful atmosphere. I really had a great time. Okay. Really a great time. No offense taken. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's been super today, and, and walking around the city last night, I mean, it just looked beautiful. Right. I'm not sure I want to hear your answer. Well, one, I wish I'd owned a spray paint store here in 1994, because I would be a millionaire. I, my son loves Bulgaria and has never been here because he plays Geospotter. I don't know if you know Geospotter. Mm -hmm. And he says, I always know when it's Bulgaria or Sofia because there's just lines and painting on every single building, which I just kind of, right. I love. The, what I love is, I, I mean, I, I, like I said in the talk, the gallery was utterly fantastic and the art was beautiful, but I really, there's some, the roofs, the architecture, the kind of, I, I'm a big fan of that thing where you see a very interesting house and it's kind of both wonderful, but it's also got a certain amount of declining. You know, there's a few pictures I've taken. And so every street that I've walked down, I've seen something that has that incredible be beauty with just that hint of entropy, that, just that, that hint and, and that. So, so yeah, I, I think it's been, someone said to me, it's the best city to get lost in, which is what I do. You just start walking and then you just go, wow, that's beautiful, that's wonderful, that's strange, that is, you know, and that's what I love about yeah. cities like yeah. this. Yeah, uh, it is great, and there is plenty of entropy going around as well, as well. Uh, all right, uh, um, a second evergreen, uh, I, I, I just want to touch on, like, how... Because what's important for us is not only to talk about science, but also to show who scientists are and how are they made and what scientists are made of. So how did you end up where you are right now? So my story goes back to when I was another graduate student, uh, not in prehistory quite times, but almost. And so I wanted to be an astronomer at first, but uh, so I duly signed up to the astrophysics astronomy a week away in the mountains. And so we went out there with the telescopes to try and do observations of binary stars. Uh, this was in the Swiss mountains, by the way, because I grew up in Switzerland. Uh, unfortunately, it was cloudy. So here's, we got the world without stars already haunted me then. And so because the sky was cloudy, I couldn't actually, we couldn't do any nighttime observation. And so instead, we resorted to looking at the sun during the day through clouds to see whether you could see some sunspots or whatever we could find. And the professor in charge told me, told us, told us all, you know, uh, whatever you do because you're looking at the sun, 
uh, never uh, look at the sun through the telescope directly with your eye, because that's a mistake you'll only do twice in your life. <laughs> Once for each eye. You okay? remember Donald Trump when he was looking at the sun? <laughs> right, yeah. So, but to a telescope is worse, right? Sure, because yeah. you can be instantly blinded. And so I was trying to point my telescope to the, to the sun, and the sun is the largest astronomical object in the sky, right? It's not so small together with the moon. And I couldn't get the sun to project an image on a piece of cardboard at the, at the, at the bottom. And so I was so frustrated and so annoyed with myself that I did the one thing that I knew I must absolutely not do. I bent down and looked through the eyepiece, and I realized a fraction of a second too late that, you know, this was now a big mistake that I was making. And I, stood up and I realized, you know, my eyesight had been saved by my ineptitude, because the thing is, the lens cap had been on all the time. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's when possible. I knew I was not cut out to be an observational astronomer, and I went to theory instead. Okay. <laughs> We, we, we did speak in the beginning that it takes a very special type of person uh, to, uh, to explore the oceans because the ocean is very vast and it's pretty similar to space. So what kind of person are you? I kind of like my own company quite a lot, which I think is quite important. Uh, you've got to be... I mean, when we go to sea, we go for a minimum of three or four weeks. And I've been at sea for as long as three months at a time. And... Um, So you've got to, like, just sort of putting your hat down and going, right, this is home for the next while, and I'm just going to live here, and it's, you know, it's going to be good, and it's going to be fine. And, and I am that sort of person, which is good as an academic as well, because you can move around and go to different countries and things. Um, and I, I love the sense of... Um, Solitude, so I'm really happy working out on deck at night. I mean, you see me like looking respectable, but my, my happy place is in a pair of big fur lined rigger boots and a hard hat on my head and, and looking very much scruffier than this. And I can, I can just be happy on deck working all night long. I just love to be on the ocean. Um, and when I've been on land too long, um, We say that we're that we're seasick, that we're that, that we're missing it, and we need our vitamin C, and uh, then we and then we uh, shoot off to the ocean again. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, we've been doing this for uh, for almost a decade. I never met a scientist who is not happy with uh, what they do and with their life. Uh, but I have met plenty of comedians who hate themselves and the lives that they live. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, what is your story then? Well, I mean, I don't have the concentration to be a scientist. That's the trouble. Is that you know, I think think what we have, you know, with both of you is is that ability to keep focused on something. And when it doesn't, I mean, can I just say by the way, Roberto's book, which I only just started reading last night is, is really worth your time if you haven't got it already because what I loved about it is the humanity in it. It starts off with a story of love, which is his, not, not the love of science, the, 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 the love for the person who became your wife. And, and it's, you know, that's one of the things that I think is beautiful. Also, in a lot of the scientists I know you've had before, is they're very good at also having the, the human contact. It doesn't become an isolated thing. But for me, I'm not a miserable uh, kind of performer at all. I, I used to, I mean, going back to the ADHD thing, and I, I've talked a lot more in the last few years about kind of neurodiversity and stuff, I used to have a very, very powerful voice that was perpetually criticizing and was really negative. And that went on till two years ago. And then a combination of a, a diagnosis from a stranger whose area of expertise with neurodiversity and just a, and a small amount of kind of anxiety medication has meant that for the last two years in particular, but even before that anyway, everything I do, I try and have make sure it's filled with love and wonder and excitement. And so I am the antithesis now is because I'm one of those English people who actually wants to go up to people and say, I love what you do. I'm not waiting to go up to someone and go, oh, brilliant, that's somebody who did something I thought was rubbish. Because, and there's a, a philosophy which I think is, someone was, I can't remember where I first read it. It's this philosophy that comes from, someone said the difference between falling off a bar stool in London and falling off a bar stool in Dublin. They said, if you fall off a bar stool in London, someone goes, ha, 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 you fell off the stool. And if you fall off one in Dublin, someone goes, ugh, I did that on Monday. And they help you back up again. And that, to me, is a full philosophy of life, because in that, do you want to enjoy your brief superiority over someone else who's fallen over, or do you want to bend down and get them back up and share that experience? And I think when we do that, something wonderful happens. Mm. Oh. 
it's it, it's <laughs> something else when you actually include comedy in in science communication. And why do you reckon this this actually works? So well, it's it's like a, it's like a secret gateway to uh, to to comprehension and to appreciation of what is what is being said. So you as a comedian, I mean, what do you what do you reckon? I mean, why why is that? I think it reduces the threat. Mm -hmm. I think people feel very threatened sometimes by ideas that they can't comprehend, and so the moment that they see an idea that they go, I don't really understand that. Your brain seems to shut down. But if you can, you know, what, what, my, what I see what I do is hopefully I can excite people about ideas enough that they will then go to your work and they will go to your work and they'll go to someone who's an expert. I'm not there to provide any sense of answers or the new questions. I just, so I think it's that bit of which is to say science is a very human pursuit. It's not done by a special group of people who say, I like counting. I'm going to start counting that now. I want to count squid. I want to count stars. That's not what either of you are. You're people who've looked at the world around you and been fascinated. So I think that's what... And also comedians are, you know, the, 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 most of my favorite, you know, my best friends, they're, they're, we're like lazy scientists. We kind of go, oh, wow, that's fantastic. And then we come up with a joke about it and we think, yeah, I won't do the full peer-reviewed research. And that's it. <laughs> So, so you can still engage. You, you want to understand why things are, but you also know you'll be distracted by something else. Mm. Uh, you did show the, the the pale blue dot, and I think it's a it's a you know pretty well known image, and it has universally acted upon like everyone who's ever seen it. You know, there's a sort of humility that is uh, uh, being bestowed upon you uh, that. Uh, science act usually does. What were the moments of humility that you actually felt in your in your careers? What was your pale blue dot moment when you actually felt uh, like this this arrogance of being a human being and you know just just fading away, feeling small and and part of something big at the same time? Uh, for me, it was definitely, uh, you know, under dark skies, in, in the presence of that uh, perpetual sublime that Emerson talks about, this fact that, you know, th th we are so small and so insignificant in, in, face, in the face of the vastness of the universe and all of this starry beauty all above us um, in, in darkness. And that is something that, you know, if you haven't experienced it, it's very difficult to describe, very difficult to put it in words. Uh, but when, when you have experienced that, and, and, and it's becoming increasingly rare to be able to do that, but when you have experienced it a few times, and I'm not an observer, so I don't go out to the big observatories and, and get that sense of, of you know, incredible canopy above us regularly. But even if you experience it only once or twice in your life, I think that's enough because it puts a seed inside you and it puts everything into that cosmic perspective. And so that is, that is a moment of, I guess, both extreme humility and feeling small and insignificant and lost in that vastness of the cosmos. But also, like Robin was saying earlier, it is, uh, there's mixed in with that this, um, this sense of wonder at actually being one of those rare configurations of atoms that have come together in such a way that are actually able to appreciate that very same feeling at the same time. So it's a combination of feeling small, at the same time wonderful because you feel so small. Hmm. Yeah, with the sky, it's a pretty universal experience as well, which you were uh, describing there. Can you, can you find the same thing with the ocean? Yeah, so the, the first time I dived in a submersible, um, so it's this really very small acrylic bubble with two of us in it. It was in the Indian Ocean, and we dived down to about 250 meters, which isn't very deep by submersible standards. But it's very dark by the time you get to 250 meters, and it's very cold, and it's taken quite a long time to get down there, so you have this sort of real sense that you're surrounded by this huge pressure of water. And, and um, a sunfish, which is a very large fish, maybe two meters tall, came right up oh, to the submersible, God. right up, and they're funny little fish, they're a very strange shape, and they've got this little mouth, they eat jelly, so they've got this tiny little mouth, and it came up to, to our window, and like, I'm in my, I might be in my 50s by then, I was certainly in my late 40s, and I had my iPhone out taking photos out the window, and all you can hear on the video is me shrieking with excitement. <laughs> it took me back to, like, being a child, because you're there and this fish is looking at you, you know, and, and suddenly you went there to look at the ocean, and there's the ocean 
like looking at you. And, and it, yeah, it was definitely my blue dot moment. Mm. It's funny, in the same situation, I would be probably feel terrified. And this is, a, this is an interesting thing where uh, I, I haven't been exposed you know, to such a variety. The first time I visited a proper aquarium, I was in my 20s. You know, probably so I kind of skip you know this uh, this childish fascination that can plant the seed. Uh, uh, so yeah, it takes exposure, I guess, to appreciate things, <laughs> you know, and not being terrified by by the unknown and, and and the first time you see something like that. So what was your moment? I don't know if there was a. I mean, one thing I remember uh, it was only about 15 years ago. Already, I'd started you know I'd started doing the science stuff, mixing it up just because I wanted to get it more out there. But I just remember sitting on a train again, another train that wasn't working, and staring out of the window. And it was just in the Lake District in the north of England. And suddenly thinking about how there was more life in that square that I could see out the window than there was in the rest of the solar system, and possibly in the rest of the galaxy, that we wouldn't know, but just the amount of life. And then thinking about the amount of life inside me in terms of all of the different microbial life. And that was kind of, that was quite daunting to just think, you know, every day, and I notice this more and more all the time now, it's kind of, I'm very alert to it, is when I hear a noise and I think that's a noise that would not be heard on any other planet in the solar system. That's an experience, that's a color, that's your all. And I think once that, those senses started to sharpen, then that just, you know, that, that it, and, and that hasn't gone away. So I'm always, you know, when I went out for a little walk in the, in the lunch break and just looking at what's growing between the cracks and just looking at what, what plants I, I won't see when I go back to the UK and all of that stuff. So I, and sometimes I was talking to someone earlier who, who uh, was saying that, you know, sometimes you can almost feel overwhelmed, but it's much better to be overwhelmed by all of that you see than to be underwhelmed and to keep your eyes you know tightly closed that bit of it's almost like i always think start the day with something wonderful because many people start the day with news or they start the day with social media and very often that's something that's already shrinking down people and ideas and i often say you know start the day by reading the first paragraph of a tuva jansen moomin book you know, start in exploits of Moomin Papa, which opens with Moomin Papa looking at the fireflies embroidering their mysterious signs on the velvet dark. And you compare that to social media, and, and you immediately... So I think that's... And, and, and I think the more that I've managed to beat the kind of my anxiety and, and kind of melancholy side, it makes me really feel... It's given me so much energy apart from anything else. So I just want to... Grab everything. But I wanted to ask you, brother, can I ask a question? Go ahead, Just, please. Because yeah. we were talking about, you're talking about, you know, mentioning the imagination of nature and some of the things that you showed. And I stuck up the piglet squid. And the blobfish, I think, is a very unfair one because we normally see that out of its environment. What for you has been that creature that you've looked at and you've gone, how does natural selection <laughs> come up with this? How does mutation and heredity lead to this? Oh, Gosh, that's such a difficult question. I mean... It's so uh, full of freaks. You know, the other nature, yeah. nature is full of freaks. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, even... Like, everybody knows I love octopuses, but even octopuses are freaks. And I, I think we were, we were talking about this a little bit because when we think of something else that's intelligent, they've always got a human-type brain. If you think of an intelligent animal, you, maybe you think of a crow, or maybe you think of a pig or a dog, and their brain is just like ours. It's got the same bits, it's got a cerebellum, it's got a medulla. But when you look at an octopus brain, right, that is based on the molluscan nervous system. So an octopus brain is made from a series of little ganglia, little collections of neurons that are in a ring around the esophagus. Now, in the octopus, those, neuro those ganglia have got very much bigger and they've developed into lobes, so it has a lobed brain just like ours, but the lobes are different and they do different things and we're starting to work out what they do. But remember where I started with a mollusk series of ganglia around the esophagus? An octopus's esophagus passes through its brain. And that means it has to have really, really big salivary glands because everything it eats 
is going to pass through its brain mm. and it needs to break them down first. So they have this radula, which is like a little iron file. They've got this big beak to crush things and then they've got these massive salivary glands putting enzymes out to, um, to, to mush everything up. And, and sometimes when, as biologists, we want to know what things eat, so we look at their stomach contents. But it's absolutely useless doing this with an octopus because it already digested it all before it even swallowed it because everything has to pass through its brain. And so, I mean, you don't actually you have to look very far to find something really weird. You just have to look inside something that we know quite well. So, But nature makes freaks. That's the whole point, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Once you get beyond single cell, you know, every, that's the whole point, isn't it? Which is this incredible variety. And hopefully more often than not, that mutation, that freakery, is something which will give some advantages. And that's what I love. It's, it's, it feels almost like when people talk about quantum mechanics as being weird, and I know Phil Ball in his book said, we should stop calling things weird, because they're not weird. They're exactly as this universe says you need to be. And quantum mechanics and being in a superposition and the octopus and all of those things, this is, this is what happens when you get entropy on this scale. It's really freaky. Yeah. Can, can I tell you another weird one now? Because now you started me thinking about them. So if you go to a beach, you often find hermit crabs. These are crabs that don't have a normal crab shell, and they, they take a little mollusk shell, and they, they live in the mollusk shell. And, and when they get bigger, they... Um, they take another mollusk shell um, and move into the bigger home. And, and sometimes they'll fight each other. If they see someone who's got a preferential shell, they'll have a little battle and, and the loser will give up the good shell and the, the other one will take it. But if you go to the deep sea, there's a type of hermit crab that doesn't use shells. It has zoanthids on its back. And if you remember, if you remember in my talk, the, one of the last slides, I showed these little yellow zoanthids. As I said, these are colonial anemones and you get anti-cancer compounds from there's a crab that when it's really small it gets a single zoanthid growing on its back and as it grows the zoanthids grow so you get these little colonial zoanthids as its shell and so you see these things running around the deep sea floor about 1200 meters deep and and the body of it looks like a crab and then they look like they've got this funny little <laughs> scottish hat of zoanthids on them and they're just <laughs> scurrying around like crabs so there's another weird one for you. <laughs> sorry i had to get that in yeah. Yeah, but the octopi oh, are so extremely peculiar and weird that um, you know I often stumble upon like 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 ideas and theses that they're the closest thing we know to an alien. You know, they're so different from from what we know about how life usually works and and complex creatures how how they actually are. Um, in this sense, uh, what do you think about about this hypothesis? And I'm going to pass the question uh, then. Uh, to you related to alien life, which is one of the big questions, of course, that uh, is on everyone's mind. Uh, do you think that octopi could be a, a possible uh, alien invader from like a few million years ago? And how plausible from a biological sense is, is that? Well, in terms of the existence of alien life, uh, life uh, elsewhere in, in the universe, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there is life out there. Just It's, it's, an, it's a numbers game. Uh, we now know that about 50% of the stars in our galaxy has got a solar system, and uh, therefore there are 300 billion stars in the galaxy, 150 other billion opportunities for life to have, to have arisen elsewhere in the, in, in, in the galaxy alone. And so the question is not very much whether there is life out there, the question is can we find it? And we are on our way to finding it because in the last few decades we've amassed over 4,000 exoplanets, planets that go around other stars, and some of them have conditions that might be conducive to life. Now, depending on how you define life, right? Because, of course, we're for now looking for conditions similar to ours, you know, water and, uh, and uh, habitability, habit habitable zone, essentially uh, taken out of the blueprint of our planet because that's the one thing we know about life. But it might be that life is weirder still out there and it might thrive in completely different conditions and give rise to completely different uh, organisms and solutions that we cannot even dream of. But uh, my bet is that uh, in, within our lifetimes, we will see signs of life elsewhere in the universe, which would be a really huge you know, revolution for our way of thinking about ourselves. We are not alone. Whether they are anywhere nearby, I don't think so, uh, but uh, they are out there and we will find them. 
Can I just ask, just on the back of that, because I know a few physicists, cosmologists, who, and, and Brian Cox is one of them, that to me, it seems preposterous to be as definite as he is about the idea that there cannot be intelligent life within our galaxy when you're talking about those numbers. And yet, when I remember doing a show about it and everyone was like, no, 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 there can't be, though, really. I mean, it's very unlikely. And I thought, but we know nothing. We know so little. I mean, the number of solar systems you're talking about, the difficulty of communication, why... What, I think it say, sounds to me a very arrogant proposition that can't really be backed up by evidence, can it? I, I agree, because there are two, two big... Uh, uh, dimensions to this question. One is the distances and just the numbers and the immensity, and you know, let alone the fact that we were talking about numbers in our own galaxy alone. Other galaxies, of which there is 50 billion other galaxies in the visible universe alone, and, of, and each one of them has got another two, 300 billion stars. Obviously, we cannot scan them all. We cannot see signatures of life so far away. But you know, it's just a numbers game, really. And so, but if, even if we limit ourselves to our own galaxy, there is the other dimension, which is the dimension of time. The fact that we've only been around for 50,000 years, we've only been sending around uh, radio signals for 100 years, we've only been sending space probes for 50 years. And any advanced civilization might have arisen at many different times in the history of our galaxy, and if we're only ever so slightly out of sync, which, you know, 50,000 years is nothing over the time scales that we're talking about. You know, we might just miss each other, you know, ships passing in the night, or their signals might take thousands and thousands of years to get to us, by which time, who knows whether there's going to be anybody around here to pick them up, and vice versa. And so the fact to be so definite about, oh, no, there can't be anybody else like us out there, I think it's another example, perhaps, of you know, you know, being uh, geocentric too much. You know, we thought we were at the center of the universe, and now it's somewhat perhaps comforting to say, oh, we are the pinnacle of civilization because we are the only ones. The Neanderthals are no longer here. The octopus is, well, yeah, but... Uh, and out there, ah, no, it's only us. I think it's, uh, it's uh, a bit narcissistic of us to think like that. So what do you think uh, as a biologist? Well, I'm, I'm happy to... Uh except that there's probably life somewhere, life out there somewhere, but uh, the octopuses are not the alien invaders. <laughs> there's absolutely no doubt about that. I mean, we, everything about them screams mollusk. And, and when you sequence their DNA, it's so similar to other molluscan DNA. We can see exactly where they sit in the tree of life. We know where they've evolved from. There is absolutely no question that they evolved on, on, on this planet. And I, I think this, this seed of an idea first came from a, um, the careless words of a scientist when, when the octopus genome had first been sequenced. That's right, yeah. There's some very odd things about the octopus genome. Um, and that, part of that is that, that some gene families, for example, those that are responsible for nervous development, have expanded massively in that genome, making it very different from other um, genomes in invertebrates. And so the scientists very carelessly said, oh my God, it's like an alien genome. And <laughs> that is not what they meant. <laughs> And, and this was picked up on by the press. And then actually some physicists wrote an article saying, I mean, and this is why you should not make comments outside your field of expertise. <laughs> Because, I mean, it, 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 it clearly wasn't right. We have all the evidence that exactly where octopuses came from, and they're from Earth. Right. Uh I, I, I just remember the words, uh, if I am correct, it was Rich Dawkins who said that if there is alien life forms, they will definitely be the product, the product of uh, natural selection and, and, and of evolution. Do you agree with that? Is it possible to have any other sort, again, no stupid questions there, right? Uh, any other possible mechanism for life to appear? What I find as a scientist is that it's very difficult for me to imagine things that I haven't already seen. This is how my brain works. So for me, natural selection just seems the obvious way for everything to happen. But I think if you ask someone more creative than me and ask an artist or a musician, they might have a wider view. And I totally respect that view, just because my imagination can't stretch to a different form of life, that doesn't mean that there can't be a different form of life. And as a scientist, I like to be extremely open-minded about what is possible. Hmm. What Isn't do you it guys basically reckon? that the Earth, in this 
kind of uh, situation we're talking about, the earth becomes anecdotal evidence because you have this one example of this story. And like you were saying, you're talking about what the possibility of, of 100 billion solar systems, possibly more. So we end up being what in the rest of science would almost be like, yeah, we did, how, can we, how can we imagine? It's a very hard thing when this is the entire world that you're, you're you know, to, to, to make any leap, it, it seems hugely improbable because we literally don't have any other, it's so hard to imagine how life would form. Even in science fiction and all of those kind of, you know, where, where again, you have all of those what ifs. It's always hard to find, so, oh yeah, this could be a possibility. And, and let's think back to before 1977. We thought that life needed sunlight for photosynthesis, and then we found chemosynthesis. So sometimes we do find something that is a little bit different. That and and that, mean, that also means we might even miss uh, signs of life elsewhere because we're not looking for the right thing as well. Sometimes we, you know, we are trying to... It's very, very hard, of course, to spot anything at all from you know, hundreds, thousands of light years away. Imagine that. But even so, we're looking for things that we are familiar with and perhaps we might overlook other signatures that we're not, we're not aware of. Yeah. I just, I just remember, uh, I think it was last year when they uh, announced the discovery of some... I will get them wrong. Some uh, Phosphine in the yes, clouds of Venus. In, in the atmosphere yes, of Venus. And we were right, uh, right. listening to this on the radio with my son and I uh, almost like jumped on my brakes and I was like, this is a historical moment. Just, you know, and we were wrong, right? Well, the phosphine was there, yes. but it was, it was of geological origin, not biological origin. And so, and that's Venus, you know, it's nearby. It's only a few tens of millions of kilometers away. Imagine doing that for a planet that's a thousand light years away. Yes. Very, very hard. Yeah, the margin of error is very, very big. Now, you work in the field of cosmology, which is, uh, you know, extremely, it's, it's extremely difficult to test theories that are mathematically correct or th theoretically correct or have been proven by the power of maths. Now, what are some of the weirdest uh, theories and ideas out there that on paper are correct, are currently we are currently unable to test because of engineering and, and, and other different obstacles uh, that, you, uh, that you find most fascinating? Well, no doubt, I think the, the, the first prize goes to the multiverse, multiverse idea, yeah. right? This idea that because we live in this mysterious universe where 95% of the universe is dark and 70% is dark energy, and nobody can explain dark energy. I mean, Einstein came up with the idea, oh, well, I can add this number to my equations, and they still work. And then he took out this number because he thought, oh, no, now that the universe is expanding, this number really is not needed, it must be zero. And then 70 years later, explosions of distant stars showed that actually Einstein was correct. That this one number that we now call dark energy or cosmological constant is non-zero in our universe, and it's making the universe accelerate faster and faster with time. And that's a mystery, right? Because this number can be there but in the equations, but nobody knows why it's got the value that it's got. It's an extremely small value, a value that nobody can explain. It's 120 orders of magnitude smaller than what theory would have it. So that's a little mistake, you know, just 120 orders of magnitude. And so people now have resorted to extreme measures to come up with an explanation. And one possible explanation is, you know, some sort of... Um, Say, not exactly evolutionary selection, but certainly some sort of selection across multiple universes. Because the theory goes, if our universe is not the only universe, but there is a huge amount of universes out there, say 10 to the 500, so 10 followed by 500 zeros. And all these universes are, universes are different between them. Some have got dark matter, some don't. Some have got atoms, some don't. Some have got a cosmological constant, some don't. Uh, and so we, as life forms, that need a very special set of conditions to emerge. We need an old universe, an expanding universe, a cold universe, a universe with atoms, with stars, with planets. There is a long list of things that need to be met. And it turns out, you know, if you dial up the cosmological constant too much, if that one number that's so very small in our universe is only a fraction larger than it is in our universe, well, the universe would expand too fast, too early, and stars would not form, galaxies would not form, and we would not be here to talk about it. And so the theory goes, well, perhaps, you know, there is 10 to the 500 universes out there, and all the universes where the cosmological content is too large, there is no life forms talking about it, and so we cannot be in one of them, you know, by design, not by design, by, by you know, by construction. And therefore, you know, we must live in the one universe that's got a small enough cosmological constant to enable us to be here. And that's the anthropic principle, the idea that, you know, we must live in a universe that looks weird 
from the particle physics perspective because even weirder universes, you know, they don't allow for the emergence, not just of us, but of any kind of life. Hmm. So, but the crazy stuff, right? Yeah. Right. And so, so Rick and Morty is incorrect, you know, in the way they, they, <laughs> that they show things. Right. Um, why do you think we are neglecting the ocean to a certain degree? I mean, there is so much talk about space, you know, and us going out there, whereas like three-fourths of the Earth are, you know, pretty much as mysterious as, uh, as, as space is. Why do you think that is? I don't think we do neglect it. I mean... Well, you don't have the SpaceX of sea exploration, do you? Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we, I mean, this is... The, the UN has declared this 10-year period, the UN decade of the ocean. I mean, they have added for sustainable development on the end of it, so there is very much a, a, a move to use the ocean as sustainably as possible. Um, and that's, I mean, it's probably very important. We use our land very much. The deep sea is a little bit special because sometimes we, we talk about that as, as it's very difficult to use the deep sea sustainably. Anything you take out of the deep sea, it's kind of like mining. The fish grow so slowly. We get this lovely little fish called orange ruffy. You might even have eaten them at some point if you've been in a posh enough restaurant. And they live to 140 years old. They don't reach maturity till they're 30. And even when they do, they don't breed every year. That sounds like Italian men. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're going to say no they people like that. They don't leave until they're 40 or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so you, you, there's lots of the deep ocean that you can't use sustainably. And, and I think that probably um, reduces man's interest in it to a certain extent because we have always gone into the ocean for, for food in, in, initially. Um, but maybe we're getting, maybe we're getting a, a sort of slightly smarter realization you know the EU's just agreed on some restoration policies and and you know we are in the UN decade of the ocean and and there's an awful lot of ships out doing science at the time I mean you can watch deep sea science live sometimes around the clock there's there's three ships that broadcast on satellite and they they broadcast their rov dives live as Oceanus Explorer, Fulcor 2 and Nautilus and, and you can just like get onto Google and, and watch their rov dives live so there is exploration going on all the time. Of course it's expensive like space it's not as expensive as space exploration but that does sort of limit some of the exploration to the, to the oceans that are surrounded by the wealthier nations certainly and I think there's a big acknowledgement that, that we, we as scientists have worked to do to help build capacity in some parts of the world so that so that those oceans can be better explored right a question for you uh robin uh you you quite eloquently uh, describe uh, the way that you observe and like consume the world around you and all uh, and all its beauty and detail uh, what is interesting for me is uh, is, is that is that a, a skill or, a, or or like a personal philosophy that you acquired like later in life, or you managed to maintain this proverbial child uh, childish uh, curiosity that allegedly all all kids have? I think there was a battle because the battle with the negative voice meant that I always wanted to do those things and explore those things, but also had a tremendous sense of kind of you know, personal failure and, and all of those things. So I think it was always in me. I was always excited by lots of ideas. But I also think a lot of people who are excited to be in the world and want to explore lots of ideas are kind of immediately... I, I mean, like, you know, Brian Cox will always say, why are you asking that weird question? Why did you say that weird thing? That's weird, that's weird. And so I think some people who kind of maybe have minds that don't seem to fit in as exactly as sometimes the linear route people want will perpetually be called, and I think it's true of scientists as well, there's enough scientists I know who get called weird and strange and why do you believe that old nonsense and, and, and whatever it might be. So I think that was what was hampering me, but I've certainly not, it's, 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 I mean, nothing that I've done has been some grand deliberate gesture. So when I started mixing up science and comedy and music, I mean, I started, you know, I thought, all right, I want to get some, some particle physicists on the show and I want to get an epidemiologist on the show and I want to get a geneticist on the show. And I would basically hide them in a, a cast of 
comedians and musicians that people knew. And then I'd go, now please welcome this particle physicist. And the audience would go, what? We didn't know there was going to be science here. And then they would come on and afterwards people would go, well, that was kind of interesting. So, but it wasn't done as, a, you know, what led to the infinite monkey cage and these big tours and stuff. People used to say, why are you doing that? There's no money in it. And I think it's because I'm, I'm driven as much as possible. Once you go, I can, I can pay the bills. I want to create weird things. So I've always wanted... But I did have a period of time where I was working very hard to try and turn myself into the shape that I thought I was meant to be. And I think a lot of people do that. I think there's a lot of battles of trying to turn yourself into think what you think is acceptable. And actually, it's far more fun to hang around with people who many people think are unacceptable. Sure. Within certain parameters. Right. Yeah, I guess the question is... Realized that could really be misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the question is related to the, uh, to the fact that it's very difficult to escape the mundane. You know, there's a question yeah. here about the nine to five uh, uh, kind of job and then you go back and have to wash the dishes and, uh, and all of that. And it's how do you calm your brain down? You know, how do you release all that pressure in order to focus on the damn flower that, yes. is, that is there? You know, that's, that's, uh, it feels to be like, like a superhuman ability sometimes. But we've never had more spare time. This is another side of it, which is, you know, one of the things that comes with curiosity is we look at the majority of the history of human beings once farming came in. Terrible mistake. Uh, you know, we would... And, and once you start to get people going, you now have to work here, and you get to that kind of Charlie Chaplin, modern times image. Yeah. Then, but, but now we've, we've entered a period of time where I think very often we haven't quite noticed that we're having our time taken away by some, you know, when you do get caught up with certain kind of social media things, or you, start, you spend too long being angry about something that you can't even change on a news media or whatever. So I think there are more things that distract us and you have to be quite conscious sometimes of going, why am I watching this? I don't even enjoy this. What am I doing? Why? It's, it's like one of the things that I sometimes say when I do library shows in the UK and it creates a tremendous amount of shock is I say, just because you've started a book, you don't have to finish it. And the audience go, huh, what? And then they go, ooh, yeah. And I had this old man come up to me. He said, I'm stuck in this historical novel. I've been reading it for six weeks. It's awful. Every day, I, I almost dread going to bed more than I did the day before, because I'd have to read <laughs> more of this bloody book. And each page seems heavier than it did the day before. He said, I don't have to finish it, do I? I said, no, you don't. He went, oh, thank you. I feel free for the first time. And it's like that thing of, you, it is an active thing. You have to sometimes go, the default position of just is a very easy position to end up in. So you have to every now and again, a bit like the staring in the mirror and your head starts to bubble and you go, hang on, I've got to be awake now. And so I think that's, you know, try not to be lured by the so many different kind of monetized systems that are there to take away your concentration and your focus and your excitement. Yeah. Time is something that we can never cut take back, right? Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's so, so excellent, excellent advice. Um, Aren't you afraid, while well, looking at the deep ocean, that, uh, yes, we are uncovering amazing species, you know, things that can help us out in creating new groundbreaking medicine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, aren't we afraid that we're going to release something that we don't want to release? Is that even a biological hy uh, correct hypothesis? That uh, It's something like the permafrost, you know, it's melting and a, a very old virus might come up and just kill us all. Uh, can we... Is there such a, such a thing for the ocean as well? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, if we want to be worried about viruses that are going to be released, we, we need to worry about things that are like us because those viruses have evolved to live in a certain environment. So it's no surprise that, that the sort of COVID-type viruses were thought to come from bats, which is another, you know, warm bodied mammal. So we're not going to release something from the ocean that is that is uh, adapted to this highly saline, cold environment, and it's going to suddenly flourish in, in humans. That's not going to happen. The diseases we get are going to come from mammals. And is it, is it possible to actually have like, enormous and giant creatures that we still haven't found somewhere deep in the ocean? Because we all know it's like it's a lot of pressure. You know, there's certain physical conditions that probably don't allow this. But still, is there a possibility there? It would be so cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. 
But I, I don't think it's very likely. I mean, the, I think the closest that we're going to get is to find a, a sort of unusual fish that's slightly different from another large fish that's already there. So I, I really love it if we could. And of course, it needs to be a cephalopod, but I don't think it's going to happen. But, but, but don't you think, Louise, that we will one day find those big spaceships in which the octopus is king? <laughs> <laughs> Please let it be me that finds them. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to put you on the spot here because uh, you you just called uh, uh, Brian Cox uh, a species, and uh, <laughs> there is a question here. There is a, that is a challenge for you. Uh, during your talk, you spoke about uh, how important it is uh, for us to to look inward, to to preserve uh, our our planet, and uh, and how the focus of going into you know becoming an intergalactic species is probably you know too much to ask considering that we need to uh, you know to preserve the planet that we uh, that we live on so i guess the question here is uh, isn't your horizon as a cosmologist ironically short than that's a very good question but you see there is there's more to it than 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 what we've discussed so far because the real deep issue is uh, as always is about power and uh, there's, there's a branch of thinking called effective altruism, which is uh, very popular among Silicon Valley libertarian space barons and uh, various uh, web billionaires. And, and um, this way of thinking is that, you know, the most rational thing to do for humankind is to maximize the opportunity for life, however defined, this could be biological life, cybernetic life, artificial life, whatever, life to uh, expand, colonize the galaxy so that the largest possible number of life forms have got net positive lives, whatever that means. And, to, and there are some people who do serious calculations showing that if we colonize the galaxy under some mild assumptions, which are entirely you know, made up, you know, in, within the next a few million or billions of years, there's going to be 10 to the 58 life forms. And, you know, if every, everybody of these 10 to the 58 life forms got epsilon net positive values, you know, do the math. This is vastly preferable than having, you know, happiness now on Earth. And so a small sacrifice, like, for example, a thousand years of peace and of, of war, I'm sorry, and climate change here, with, the, you know, almost everybody being exterminated by these two things on Earth is entirely acceptable you know, in this view, because if we then, then become intergalactic, we will colonize the universe. That's absurd. This is absurd. This is not science. This is pseudoscience. It is very, very dangerous because there's lots of people who actually strongly believe in that and they have the means, the resources, and the, the firepower to actually change public discourse and, uh, and technology as well in, 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 in pursuit of this pipe dream. So, as a cosmologist, yes, of course, we are, you know, we're used to the big numbers. You know, we look back 13.8 billion years and we ask ourselves what's going to happen in 200 billion years to the universe when dark energy takes over and so on and so forth. But this is physics. But we, here we're not talking about physics. Here we're talking about society. We're talking about something we're discussing yesterday in the podcast as well. You know, it, can we use physics to understand those issues up to a point? Because once you start modeling, you know, this kind of... Um, uh, ideas as if they, those were particles in a phys physics experiment, well, people are not particles. And suffering and extermination of not just people, but also you know, the, the environmental, uh, ecological system all around us today matters more than what might or might not happen in a million years' time. And so the real question for me is not a I mean, myopic question, is the focus that we all must have. How do we become good ancestors? In the memorable words of John, Jonathan Salk, the inventor of uh, the polio vaccine. And we, that's what we are failing to become, good ancestors. We're failing to become ancestors at all if we continue on this path. And, you know, thinking about the next... 200 billion years doesn't make sense if we don't make the next 100 years. I mean, right. It's a very specific question for you, Robin. What is your favorite science-related joke? Uh, it is, my, my favorite one remains the uh, Heisenberg speeding down the freeway joke, which I'm sure you know, which is Heisenberg speeding down the freeway and uh, a policeman pulls him over and says, do you know how fast you were going? He says, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> so that's... Uh, 
I think I think that's the first one that I ever kind of heard, and I thought that's a, that's a, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, what is the? I've met a f- quite a few uh, comedians, and they have this. Uh, I don't know whether it's natural or a thought skepticism towards. Uh, the world, uh, meaning that they're, they seem to me to be more inquisitive, more more skeptical to uh, to ideas. They're very rarely religious, for example. Uh, is there a relationship between comedy and that type of thinking? I th- you would love to say yes, and say my tribe are good, but it was a very interesting thing to watch, in particular during lockdown, in particular during COVID, that I suddenly went, whoa. There's also a lot of conspiracy theorists in, and, and it's that, I mean, I think one of the things that can happen, not just with comedy, but generally is, is that a, a career like that, which is feeding your ego very often, if it doesn't then work out for you, you have to work out a way why you haven't become the arena-based comic or whatever it was. And I've noticed a surprising number. So I think it can go both ways as well. I think there are certainly probably the ones that you've met and certainly most of my friends, I would say, uh, are working hard to be skeptics but not cynics. I think most of them, which is, you know, again, comedy can very easily then become cynicism. And uh, I also think that I find it a little bit disappointing that some of the comics who've most loudly been the kind of atheist comics have also then really fed on on being very cruel in their comedy. And very, and to me, one of the great things that comes if you are, are not led by a dogma, if you don't have whatever scriptures it might be that says you need to hate this group of people, to then free choice kind of hate. So it's, I, think there's, I think it's a lot more of a mix than you might imagine. But I do think that that sense of being on the outside is something that will help because you you know you go to a different town every like you're saying that that sense of solitude you know but but I think it, it it's not it's not inherent in in the whole breed of comedians and also now it's become such a big industry certainly in the UK that it's got a very wide variety of people there's about 200 comedians who are the only right wing comedian in the United Kingdom it's getting a really hard sales thing now right Uh, all right, we are uh, almost out of time. So by tradition, again, you already gave us lots of very inspirational thoughts and things to think about, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to address uh, the public as, a, as you know, final thoughts that you, that you want to share. So we can, we can go ahead. My final thought is uh, to remember to look up, especially you know, on a dark night, go out, look up to whatever is out there, the moon, Jupiter, the stars, mm-hmm. seek out that darkness, look up and feel small. And feel small. Well, to follow that, I'm going to say look down. Next time you're on a ferry, you just go and stand outside and look down and just think how deep it goes below and just think what's down there because it's not just an empty space. I'm going to say look round because it's the only one that I've got left. Uh, I wanted to just do that spinal tap. Have a good time all of the time. Um, But I think all of those, it's, it's that thing which is, I'll go back to something I said before, which was about holding on to your beliefs with a loose grip. I think it's so important. I think we've seen it in science as well. There are plenty of scientists who reach a point where they cannot, like, you know, there's a great story of Fred Hoyle, who, you know, thought the Big Bang Theory, he, he coined the Big Bang Theory, he came up with what he thought was a preposterous title, which is then, um, here was someone who was a great scientist. He was not, he was a, you know, Fred Hoyle, but then he came across something that just hit against what he felt. I mean, from talking to cosmologists, they said one of the problems was the Big Bang meant there was, there was an end. And he couldn't deal with that idea. And I think, so that's the thing is, make sure, you know, be ready to change. Be ready to, to be as malleable as you can. Be filled with the best form of doubt. Well, thank you very much for being part of this event and thank you. stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.